Okay, um, thank you for coming. Thank you for giving me the time. Um, so um, I'll talk a little bit about the centralized internet um, and what is the problem that uh, 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 basically triggered uh, this project um, to start. Uh, then um, I'll talk about um, the solution that we are working to this problem, and, and then I will go in more detail become that how we implemented this solution, um, and at the end it become a bit more um, developer-y, and I say if, if, if you have developed an app and you want to integrate the solution into it, how to, how to do that. Um, so let's jump into this. Um, okay, um, so, and just not to be out of thing, the, the solution we are talking about is called WeNet because um, it's in Montreal and it sounds like we, I say. Um, but um, so this solution is developed by, by, by two organizations. Um, one, Equality, and the other is online. I'm just introducing them fast. Um, um, equality is a, a basically um, digital um, human right uh, uh, nonprofit. So they they basically developed um, solution to make privacy, security, and access to information easy for for um, civil society and human rights organization. Um, ASL19 is in Toronto. Um, so it's basically its name is is, is term. Persian translation of word Article 19. Um, they were funded, founded in, in 2012. Um, they are concentrating on on basically uh, freedom of expression in 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 in, in MENA region, uh, Middle East and North Africa, and um, working on the uh, digital anti censorship solution for this area and also for easy access to information and transparency for in these regions. Okay, so what is the problem? Uh, this is the uh, net freedom map from Freedom House and um, basically showing um, the areas that um, the internet is censored heavily in, in purple. Um, for example, Russia wasn't wasn't purple a few years ago, but it's getting worse there. And um, the technology to to censor the internet is getting more complicated and more complicated every day. Um, still, um, in a lot of places, it's pretty easy to circumvent the, the censorship. But but there are few leading countries that um, doing a good job. Uh, so some example of this failure of the central internet. Um, so uh, for example, um, there was the contested uh, election in 2009 in Iran. Maybe a lot of you are not, don't remember it, but um, basically what happened, uh, all the um, election monitors uh, were, were um, putting all their uh, eggs in the basket of SMS for the phone. At the time, there was no real smartphone. Everything was just SMS on your cell phone. And basically, um, the government, which wanted to basically change the result of election, I guess, um, I don't know what else could be the motivation, they basically turned off the uh, messaging service. So it's a bit, bit hard to imagine that in, in, in Toronto. Uh, but basically, every, like, 60, 70 million people in Iran, they woke up one day and then text message didn't work on cell phones. Uh, and it didn't work for a month after because after that there were protesters and they used to use, they, they, they thought that they are going to use this text message to, to organize their protest against the result of election and uh, all the irregularity that happened and, and then that, that um, network didn't work for a month. It was very easy for government to shut it down. It was central, you know. Um, the next election after that, so they they had that in mind, and now the smartphones were more uh, popular. Um, basically, 
they choked the internet. Um, so they started, um, they started with censoring TLS, HTTPS websites. Um, they become very, very slow. So they, I think they were training people for a month before not to use HTTPS. And a few days before election, all protocols were dropped beside HTTP uh, after 60 seconds. And if this protocol have you know, encryption, then they need to do a handshake. And, and handshake takes time. And basically, and the internet wasn't very fast. They had a law that would say, at home, you can't get faster internet than 128 kilobit. So after your handshake got, went fast, basically your connection would drop, and then you don't get anything. So for a few days, the only thing that was working in Iran was HTTP, and, and they could make money stuff in HTTP. It's not encrypted, so they would drop any word that they don't like, you know, basically. And then after that, um, so so they they after that, basically, they changed the, the basically structure of the internet in Iran first. They told all a vital service like banks, you know, governmental organization to not get any server out of Iran. And then basically they put all the server inside. So the purpose is that when that situation happened, they can easily cut the international internet. And they, they still have the, the internet inside Iran or the internet, if you call it. Um, and their vital service is working. And for a few days, you, you don't need to read, you know, your academic papers. So is okay, um, but that is basically, when you have this um, central system, you know, you can censor it so easily. Um, China, another example of, they are probably the best in censoring the internet. Um, they have very uh, sophisticated attack, they have active probing, they go, they check if this random IP on the internet is trying to, for example, helping people to bypass, and then they, they basically censor it. They have like program to just go and sneak to find this um, anti-censorship tool. They are a state, they have this great firewall of China, which is a stateful fire firewall. So basically, in some cases, if you use a server using a forbidden word, like Tian, Tianman Square, um, the firewall basically drop any connection from you to that server, no matter if it has bad word or doesn't have bad words, you know? Um, so that is a huge thing for a country like China that has so many people, and it can't keep track. So, so that is not the case in Iran, you know? They de deal with each connection differently. But, but in China, this firewall has a state. Um, Russia, Russia was benign maybe two years ago. The, inter the, the censorship was very easy to bypass. It was URL based. Uh, now it's getting much more aggressive. They're working with the Chinese. And a few months ago, they, they got this um, lawsuit against Telegram and they wanted to drop Telegram. So basically, they, they banned um, Amazon and Google Cloud, a big part of it. And the internet got like very uh, shaky for a few days. And it, had, it, it resulted in, in something that people were using to bypass the censorship. They call domain fronting. I talk about it later, but um, so basically everything is getting harder, and and relying on central, you know, anti censorship, relying on censorship um, solution based on a central model, is becoming harder and harder. Uh, so domain fronting was one of the things that a lot of people were using just a few, few months ago to bypass the censorship. So the domain fronting is that um, when you send a request to Google or Amazon uh, Cloud, it has a um, easily seen, like unencrypted part. And then after that, it has an encrypted part. So basically, for example, you go to the bandwebsite.com slash um, whatever, index.php. HTML. Now, um, this uh, basically this cloud fronting was because because the banned website and non-banned website both of them are are hosted on Google Cloud. People would send a request in the clear part. It would say non-bannedwebsite.com, and the encrypted part would say actually I wanted bannedwebsite.com. Uh, and Google and Amazon were accepting of that, they would go, okay, I see the encrypted part of your request and they would actually serve what you want. But after this Telegram story that happened, now Google and Amazon stopped that and a lot of services were like Signal was 
was uh, uh, work uh, was based on this to bypass censorship. Tor was using that. Um, now it's not working anymore. Um, another way they like uh, people were using is a storing file on s3.amazon.com. So this is the part that is not censored, not encrypted. So the sensor only see that you are seeking a file on s3.amazon.com. Uh, he doesn't see which file you, are want, do we, you want, and the whole world are storing file on s3.amazon.com, and the idea was it would, they would never censor this. But recently, in, in Iran has started to sen censoring this, saying people like don't store file on s3. And basically, that, that, you know, that, that solution also fell apart. Uh, so that was the problem. Um, we want uh, to have a solution to this problem, basically. And the solution we are looking at is, is look, making this anti-censorship effort you know, uh, more decentralized. And uh, the solution we came up with is called WeNet. And in, in very uh, simple term, I'm, I'm going to basically the rest of this presentation is basically to explain what is this story about this, this term. But, but I just give you some idea that um, what is it? It's basically a network of nodes they are cooperating together to basically serve the web, web to each other. And um, when they want to serve the web, that is HTTP protocol, when you make a request, um, it's going to basically either using peer-to-peer -peer routing, basically using each other to route the request to the server, or try to find this request that has been done with somebody else and stored in a network. So serve the request from basically the peers. The idea is not very um, novel, but um, making it actually a reality that people actually working it, wor like using it, is a challenge here. Um, I just so in this section, I want to talk to about wh why did we choose this this solution. Um, so here. Um, Maybe it's a bit redundant. We are here just because we think decentralized networks are better. Um, but I just say a few words. Uh, so this reliable routing is basically a, the reply to the censorship. Um, so in, in current form of the internet that you have, you have one route. You go to your ASP. And after that, they will basically route you. And then from a very predictable route, um, and that can ha and be a single point of failure because that you have that this predictable route. Either this route is broken or somebody put a censorship device in the middle and basically uh, um, you don't get the request you want. Uh, on the other hand, P2P routing diversify the route. So basically it goes from one way, it doesn't work, it can change and use another uh, set of uh, basically another path that hopefully haven't passed through that. Um, um, point of failure. Uh, the other thing is uh, more exciting about it is that like in current form of the uh, anti-censorship, you, you set up a pro proxy, you go to the proxy, and then that proxy will basically get you the, the, the data that is not uh, being, you, you are not being able to, to, to retrieve. But uh, the problem with this is that everybody will go to that proxy, and the more people get into this network, you know, you are going to choke that proxy, and it cannot load um, the information you want. And the other, like when you are in the P2P model, in the centralized model, you know, you have more, point, more, more nodes in the network, you know, you have more helpers and more diversified route. It actually makes the more network more reliable. Uh, the distributed cache is much more easier to see. So here, you know, the F, in the model that is, um, if we have currently every information is stored in that server and everybody will go to that and and put a lot of pressure on that server, and also if the server goes down, then you have nothing more than that. In the P2P model, you know, the information is stored across the network, one node goes down, it's probably in somewhere else, you know, you have redundancy and you have different routes. Uh, some kind of, um, you know, ethical, ideological point is here that, you know, when people are using this, this solution, in contrast to this centrally provided solution by West, uh, for them to bypass the censorship, you know, they are taking the some part, some some. Um, they are taking active part in 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 fighting the censorship instead of just connecting to a proxy that was uh, set up to them. Um, so 
it seems like more of a um, user-based solution to this problem. It's also because the whole network is helping you to bypass the censorship. It's very difficult to assign a guilt and say, oh, you can, you, you help these people to bypass censorship. Uh, it's very hard to, like, you know, prosecute, like, 50 million people. Um, so the case for supporting current web. So basically, like, we talk about, I think IPFS came up in this, and, and they call themselves the distributed web, but... Um, we, in this solution, thought we don't want to just come with a new web. We want to uh, support something that um, already people are using f to it. Um, one of the reasons is here, like, if you bring an anti-censorship solution that is based on a te new technology, what, what you are end up with is, is a society that's um, divided by two people who knows how to pass the censorship and then they have a better idea about what's actually politically happening in the country and the people who, who don't and then basically accept uh, the narrative of the country. And basically, you end up with a, with a divided society. So that, that, that is actually currently happening in a lot of this country that censorship is very prominent. Um, basically, people who are rich, they buy VPN. And geeky people will have like some solution that nobody else has access to. And the poor people, you know, they just stay with the state media. And then in the election, you see like those people basically are coming from two different cultures. You, you can't believe that how you talk to a person near you and he, he basically tells you another um, narrative. I mean, that, that happened in the U.S. election, not because of this reason, because you were, they were using social media, so their sources were actually different. But here, you know, uh, using a traditional media also, like, we'll end up with that. So, so supporting something that is um, already there, people know how to use it, is very essential. Um, so basically, I call it a transparent integration. So basically, pe people used to, for example, use BBC app. And now it stopped working. You know, if you come here and you give them, like, IPFS app, and you have to do this, and you get your data like that, and the whole website need to be redesigned, to work with IPFS, then um, you will have a hard time within, with, with basically um, gathering everybody who are using the, the, the previous technology. Uh, so you want the user to go with the technology with almost zero configuration. If they were using BBC app, they update their app, they should get the same thing from before. On the other hand, again, if I'm coming to the developer of BBC app or other people who are bringing information to people and say, oh, I have IPFS, you know, let's redesign your app, write this, like this, and that is, you know, that has a, you know, adoption curve of a very, very slow, a slow rate. Um, you want something that you come to the developer, you say, I know you were giving your information to people, now it got blocked, just add to this two, three line, and, and you should start working again. So that, that, that is a motivation, you know, to stick to HTTP that currently is working, a lot of apps are using. Um, the other thing that was good about HTTP was the cache. Um, so HTTP has native support for basically a storage. And now, before it was a storage, now we can just make it a distributed storage. And then, again, that will help to us to not go to the developer and say, oh, instead of storing your file on your HTTP server, now just bring it back and store it around the world. Basically, um, because HTTP already was supporting uh, storing this uh, HTTP responses, now we're just going to store them in distributed format. So um, the, the developers that were developing the app, now they don't need to learn a new API. Um, sorry. Uh, and then the other thing that's, that, that is here is that we get the benefit of um, helping two tires network. So one of these, this is a example of um, that internet that Iran has built. And this is from March 2017. Um, these are all the ISPs in Iran and how the connection in Iran goes around. Those two dark green nodes are um, telecom connection infrastructure company and information technology company. These two basically serve 90% of the requests that are going out of the country. If you look at the map of Canada of the same thing, it's definitely not like that you basically go to US if, if you need a request and you come back. You don't go like 
every all the requests go to Ottawa and then out of Ottawa it goes somewhere else. Um, or a lot of requests goes to Europe and serve back here. Here is everything is inside unless you, you want international connection. Then 90% of people are getting it from this green node. And basically, um, uh, the country puts basically their censorship box there so they can um, control everybody uniformly here. Now, if, if we get this hybrid approach that's basically um, use all the nodes inside the country to help to serve the information, then basically you, 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 have, you have much better chance um, to bypass this such a system, use this such a system. Because if one person can p possibly pass the censorship, then that person will bring the information inside the country and then it will be shared there. Um, the other th model of the two tire network, our mesh network, um, we had a mesh, we have a mesh network in Montreal called Vesolib, and I was on that. Um, a lot of nodes are just there, and some few people, you know, they 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 share their internet connection with the inside network. So uh, if you have a, such a network, then basically you are greatly using the mesh network um, infrastructure to load your content that you want and you don't go for every request out on the internet and basically put pressure on those nodes. So this, this kind of a design will help also this kind of a network um, to save some you know, bandwidth. Okay, so now I'm going to talk more what exactly WeNet is doing to basically implement this hybrid, hybrid approach of decentralized network and centralized request. So I'm just 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 reminding you what was WeNet is a basically a network of node. It tries to serve the web. It used peer to peer routing and, and distributed caching. It's free open source technology. Um, so it's a library you can use, you can modify, um, and it has a highly uh, pluggable structure. So basically, I will talk about that. Um, so what's the pluggable structure? Um, Basically, you can take it part, this technology that may help people to communicate, you can take it out and put a new technology there. Uh, why we thought about that? Because like peer-to-peer -peer is hard to re regulate, which is, which is actually the point we like it here. We don't want everybody to tell us what you do. Uh, but this basically bring adversarial behavior. Basically, they are going to ban something, put censorship device on that. So we wanted to be able to respond very fast to this. If one, if one of type of connection got censored for whatever reason, we can take that module out and put another module that the government has not figured out how to censor it yet. Um, so the both main parts that you can, you can module, exchange its modules is the caching modules and the transport module. Caching modules are the modules that basically store the data, the, the HTTP request that serves and it can now be stored in a cache, so they serve inside the network. And the transport module are those that, that make your connection out of the network. Um, so caching module. They basically act like a caching module of the, street, the caching proxy. So the request will go to the caching module, to, to the, basically to the network, and, and this caching module will start storing this request in the network. Um, so basically, when a content be requested from the web, this caching module is stored it in the network. Uh, a routing module, we call them vServices. Um, these are basically serve the request. So when, when you make a request, first we, s we try to see if, if I can serve it from inside the network, from the storage. If it doesn't, then basically this module will try to get it out of the network and get it to the, to the server that you're requesting at. Um, so there are situations, for example, if these nodes are serving you in a country that there is a censorship, there is a situation imaginable that you want to cover this node. You don't want them to be available. Everybody knows, oh, this is the node that bypassing you from in a censorship. So there is a need for anonymous communication in, in this case, which, which we have put in uh, WeNet. Um, so um, now more detail. So here um, an example that what will happen basically. I mean, it's not very complicated, but um, so 
so in this diagram, this um, browser and, and this part of the Winnet that is client, we call the client, is, um, is, is demonstrated by, by this orange dot. So basically, you are in your browser, you make a web request, and or your app, you know, it makes a get request, and they basically will send it to this client. This client will get the request and, and decide what to do with it. Um, so in the current implementation, actually, uh, um, so when, when WeNet is not there, basically the request can go directly to this web server, and a number one, I'm talking about the number one diagram, and come back. Uh, but maybe this web server is not available. So um, maybe is, 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 is the, this direct connection, there's a censorship there. You know, this, this purple circle shows the censorship zone. And, and this request cannot get there, and um, it fails. So actually, in current implementation, uh, the sta step three will, will, will kick in. In a step three, basically, the node start asking the nodes on the distributed network, and um, it says, do you have the reply to this request already stored in you? And if one of them has it, then they will serve it. And if that doesn't happen, then step two will kick in. Using like this different system of transport, basically they go to one of these WeNet um, servers and they ask them to basically serve them this, this request. Now a more boring in <laughs> description of this, um, just just if people are interested that exactly what is happening um, technically here, you make a request, there is a CA there, it makes a man in the middle attack, like check, basically it opens your encrypted request, it looks at this, is, is it cacheable or you're sending your password or is your Facebook account or something that you don't want to share with other people. And if it's, if it's something information that everybody can see, like a BBC News, then it uh, will go to the to this part. I, I go here just to show you what I'm talking. So this guy will decide if he's cacheable or not. If it's non-cacheable, basically use the we services, and basically will go and get it from the origin service. If it's cacheable, then it will come and look at the distributed cache here. Basically, it, it's going to query all other nodes in the network and say, do you have it or you don't have it? And if they, they have it, basically it serves here. I mean, this is not as, as, as simple as that. This is like giving you more this detail. It will go to the cache indexes if it's there. If it's there, it goes and asks people. If it's not there, then it will go and ask this guy who calls injector and say, you know, I wanted this request wasn't there. The injector says, okay, it will go serve the request, import, import it, insert it in a distributed cache. And the next person, the network will go to us and doesn't need to go there and will get it from the distributed storage. Um, so this is a lot of work. So basically, uh, how did we implement this? Basically, we used whatever was there to implement this system. So currently, the caching module, the only one that is actually working is IPFS in our implementation. Um, so. Um, Again, uh, IPFS came up earlier here. IPFS is a P2P distributed file system, basically. So you have your hard drive that has a file system. Now you have a P2P distributed file system. In Linux, actually, you can mount IPFS on your computer and basically um, get any file there with like normal with Linux command. So it looks like a hard drive, but it's just stored in many different nodes. Uh, the technology behind it um, for, for the getting the data from different nodes is similar to BitTorrent, but you know it has all this um, extra utility that is much it, BitTorrent is much harder to look at as a as a file system. It's like different swarm that you download different uh, file and then you have to do different uh, stuff to get each file. But here, all this technology is there to work it as file system. Um, mostly the stuff are content based. Uh, addressable. So basically, ev the name of every file is is come from its content. Um, there is a new there is a naming system though there that basically you can have a consistent name for a file. So in normal situation, when you change the content of the file, the file name will change also. Uh, but if you can use this mutable content naming, which is called IPNS. Uh, 
to uh, basically for, for a file that you basically you want to change the content, but you don't want the name changed. Basically, that is how, how a hard drive works. You know, every time you edit your file, the name doesn't change. And these are not very fast, you know. Um, for that reason, the only thing that for currently we use in Sino for this is the cache index. Basically, it says where you go and check for this database that have the, have the address of all the files in the network. That is always the same because every time you run WinNet, you don't, you don't, you need to, to have this permanent thing. Everything else is not, is not uh, have a permanent name. So when you change the name of the web page, content of the web page, you'll go and get it stored somewhere else. Um, so for the transport modules, the one of the, the easy one is basically here. I mean, is a TCP directly to TCP HTTP connection. Uh, it's fast, it goes to that injector, I just go back here. So I'm talking about this cloud. Um, um, here, um, it doesn't have a cloud, basically, that, that module, it just goes directly to that orange thing. I mean, most of the current anti-censorship solution do that, so we just uh, included that there. At least testing is easier with that, so. Um, the other one is I2P. So this is this is one is more with the merit of a P2P uh, network. So basically here, you are using a peer-to-peer -peer, um, communication. You, you never go to the node directly, and basically use six hops to get um, to the to the destination you want. And this for this reason you don't. This is like a bit like a. I mean, this is exactly like Tor hidden service. So I2P and Tor are basically the same, except Tor index is centralized. Tor authority is centralized, I2P is not like that. Um, the routing table is distributed. Um, so you can see, see P2P as a distributed Tor. Um, so everything is a Tor hidden service. So um, the server that are say, serving you, you don't need the IP. You get this public key and you don't know where they are in the world. And so basically when you make a request, it's go through the six hops and, and come back from that, that server, it's very hard, you know, to put a finger on somebody in and block them so you can censor the network. Um, so we are working on adding more um, caching module. We are working on making BitTorrent uh, to be another basically distributed file system for us. Um, the, like everything in BitTorrent has a parallel in IPFS, except um, there are benefits with BitTorrent. Like the IPNS protocol that I told you, BitTorrent has it called BEP44, but um, for some reason it's much faster. Uh, we don't know why. Um, we, we have submitted a bug for IPFS, but for BitTorrent, this, this request, basically to get the name of the file and get the content, uh, uh, the place of the content in the network, it's resolved in three seconds. Still not very um, fast, but for IPFS, it takes one minute, which that is why what we only use it for the for the root of the cache. Um, the other transport, we worked on GNU-Net. I don't know how many people heard about GNU-Net. Um, it's a work in progress. Um, uh, the problem with GNU-Net, our, our main um, thing was Android, and GNU-Net doesn't run on Android. It runs a lot of different process, and, and mobile uh, platform don't like that. So for now, we put a hold on that. The other system we are working on is like a not, you know, we don't do the direct connection, which is very easy to cut, but we do few hop connection, which is not as good as I2P, which is completely anonymous, but on the other hand, it will become more uh, efficient. So basically, you go there, you say, I want to get to the server, I can't, it's censored. Then you go to the network, say, is there anybody here that can connect to that server that I can send my request to you? And then somebody will say, oh, I can. And then you connect to them. And then if there's nobody there, then you go and say, is there anybody in this network that has no, no somebody on the network that can go and connect to that? Then if somebody says yes, then by two hop you can go there. And that can go dynamically higher. Uh, we are going to use BitTorrent to basically answer this question. So the way that you go to the network and say, who is there to help me? Basically, you go to the net, the network to the DHT of BitTorrent and ask there, and if volunteer is there that want to help you to bypass, will show up there. It's not as, as good as you know I2P because it's not completely anonymous. 
Um, so we still have challenges. Um, so a speed of I2P, you know, you get six hop. Everybody should pass this. So basically, you get the lowest speed of the six people in the way. And in, 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 in practice that I checked, we get like 16 kilobyte per second speed, which is not ideal, although it's better than not getting the content in sensor area. But um, is, uh, it's not as ideal. Um, the other problem, uh, I2P is not designed, I2P is designed to work as a mesh network. So when you're in I2P, you get this distributed routing table. It's designed that every router can see every other router. While in the censorship situation, not every router can see other routers. Basically, some, some links are broken. And so it's good to basically improve the behavior of I2P to not believe there is a mesh network and start like using, you know, um, broken routing protocol to bypass, like basically check other routers and don't assume that you can see everybody. Uh, IPFS uh, compared to BitTorrent, you know, is much in a smaller network, so it's DHC is not resilience. Basically, in BitTorrent, you can go and attack the DHC and start lying to other people in the network when the question come, and uh, still you don't go anywhere because there are so many other people on the network that they don't lie. And if you start lying and say, oh, this content is there, while it is not there, you know, you, you don't hurt the network. There's like thousands of other people can give you the true information. Um, IPFS doesn't have as many nodes, so is so if the government wants to set up like lying nodes that basically trash a DHD by lying to the request you want, basically IPFS is much easier than BitTorrent. Um, caching and privacy. So currently we are very very conservative in caching any requests, you know. Um, because you know there are some websites that broken and they use HTTP protocol and they don't use like a correct caching directive for their password page. So you go and you type your password, and basically, if based on the HTTP protocol, I should be able to cache this request. Then your password will be cached and distributed in the network. Um, but for now, we are using very conservative approach, means the cache effectiveness is much less. Um, the other um, thing we have here is plausible deniability. So for now, when you are in the network and you make a request to the distributed storage, basically is you, they basically know. If they look at the, dis be, be part of distributed storage, then they know that you made that request. Um, Adding plausible deniability that, you know, random people make random requests, not because they want it, just because the app did it, you know, will help the security of people. Other problem, P2P data cost is much more than the central, you know, you make one request, but here you have route, you route other people requests, you serve them, you know, the cost is much more. Um, the last one is, so when you add this WeNet uh, library to an app, like let's say the BBC app that got censored, uh, and then another app is there, like New York Times, that got censored too. Then, basically, you're installing two nodes on your cell phone, and that becomes like very hard on your CPU. So we need to find a way that you know every cell phone should be one node. But currently, it's not like that. So there's a lot of work to do, but still, we have some of them worked. Um, so let's. Um, I just go very fast through this. Um, look at the stuff that already there. Um, is a demo failure um, <laughs> principle. A lot of my demo doesn't work. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. Um, I will try, but if it didn't work, you know, just um, the, the browser, I couldn't get it work. Uh, we are working on the master branch. It's not a good um, thing, but it's a work in progress. So a lot of them are like that, so I, I, I just recompiled it here, so hopefully <laughs> I couldn't get it work there, but maybe it works here. Um, I just put this down and then. Um, okay, I'll figure it out. Okay, stay here. Um, I'm going to fire an injector here. One. Sorry. Okay. 
Um, anyway, if you see, it, it connected um, to the IPFS database. Is here. Can I use it? Oh, oh it's working. Um, yeah, so this is the IPFS database that it connects to. Um, and I fire a um, basically client that tell it the client that use that that injector and that IPFS database to basically connect to the internet. So basically it's going to use this as this distributed storage which is the same as this and this is where the address is working. What happened? <laughs> um, oh. That is interesting. Okay, so these two are here. I'm, um, so I have, I have my browser set up to use this, this proxy. Um, okay, client accepting 88. Sorry, but anyway, we, we, I, I try. <laughs> part of it got loaded at least. Um, I mean, if you look here, you see um, this is the part of the injector that got the request, and is, is currently is trying to publish it on the on the on the web. So it's basically this is always some when when it get published on the on the IPFS, it will give you a log here that basically published the BBC, that part of the BBC on the internet, on the, on the, on the IPFS. Um, we only have five minutes. Um, I just want to show you how easy is it to, to, um, to integrate this, so to within Android. Um, so basically you compile Winet, which I did just now, 
Uh, what you need, you just get the VNet file library, you copy it in, in your Android project. So basically the, the, the assumption here I want to tell you is that if you're developing Android project, uh, Android app, and you send it to this area and then basically get censored, and now you want to basically use this just to bypass it, it's very easy just to integrate with that. So basically, and this is Android Studio, you copy the, Um, the, you copy the library basically somewhere that you can you can basically use. Um, oops. Um, you add this one line here. You say my 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 app. So before it was working, everything was working. It was HTTP app. You just add this one line here. You say my app is depending on this um, library. We need library, and then basically on the start of your app, you basically only add this one line. We need new, we need basically, and you say, I'm using this injector, this address from IPFS, and basically the credential. And after that, you run this app, and then basically all your communication will go through this network which basically try to serve it from the decentralized network first and if it's not possible then try to peer to peer you pass pass through the network to the to, to the target that is probably blocked um, so basically you you really need to add three lines to make your app work with this uh, network Okay, thank you very much.